the fifth episode of the CIFWA Chat Hour. This is the Chat Hour put together by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, a over 50-year-old organization of professional fantasy and science fiction writers. Uh, we invite you to check out our website at CIFWA.org. I'm Kat Rambo. I'm the president of CIFWA. I'm also a writer and editor and teacher. And I'm going to go around and introduce our fabulous panelists because today we're going to be talking about how to sell your books at conventions. And I'm going to start with David Butler. Hi, Kat. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Dave Butler, and uh, I'm, uh, my uh, books include uh, The Kidnap Plot, out from Knopf about six weeks ago, and uh, Witchy Eye, forthcoming from Bain in the spring. Uh, I'm also the acquisitions editor at Wordfire Press. And as uh, many Wordfire Press authors do, I travel with the press to conventions, usually about one a month, uh, Comic-Con style, and little large conventions, where I stand behind a table and sell books for three or four. Awesome. And I have stood beside you. We have sold each other's books. It's been Thank awesome. You. Jen, how about you? Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Brozak. I am uh, an author, editor, game designer, and a small press publisher. Uh, I have averaged 10 to 12 conventions for the last year, last four years. Uh, and one of the things, one of the reasons I proposed this is because the last three conventions, other authors have come up to me and asked, how do you sell so many books and ebooks? And I thought, just before Worldcon and DragonCon and such like that, this would be a great panel. Uh, and my most recent book is uh, Karen Wilson Chronicles. It was on the bus of my four book uh, urban fantasy series. Awesome. And Mike, how about you? Hi, I'm Michael R. Underwood. I'm an author. My latest series is Genrenauts, which is a series of science fiction adventure novellas. Uh, the most recent one is The Substitute Sleuth. Uh, I'm also the North American Sales and Marketing Manager for Angry Robot Books, a science fiction publisher, which is where I do most of my hand selling at conventions. Uh, we've done Chicago Comic Entertainment Expo, Emerald City Comic Con, Convergence. I'm going to Gen Con this week, and then we're also doing Worldcon. So uh, I coordinate the booths, uh, set the schedule and the staff, and lead the hand selling. Okay, and so let's let's go around and talk about. Because selling at a convention is it requires a very specific set of skills, I think. So let's talk about that idea of how do you sell a book to someone at a convention? And Jen, when we were talking about this, you talked about the idea of making it an experience. So I was wondering if you would start us off with that. Uh, I believe I learned this from Ed Greenwood. Uh, he was the first person I co-wrote a book with and signed with. People come to conventions for experiences. They come to support you as an author or an editor, but what they want is to get something they can't get on Amazon or can't get uh, in a brick and mortar store. What they want is a, a conversation with the, the editor, the author. Uh, they want you just to talk with them and have, just share a little bit. They want a connection. And I try to approach every potential customer as someone who could be a friend. And I have gained a lot of friends and people who are like, well, tell me which books are the new ones. I'll buy them. They don't even care what the books are at this point. They, what they want is that connection with me as an author or editor. And, and they know they like what they read. And in some cases, they may not even read it. I don't, I don't know. It's just... Uh, I try to make every conversation something that they can remember. Um, I offer to sign things, uh, even ebooks, and we'll get into that later. Um, and if I remember them, and you know, occasionally I have to apologize, I don't. I meet th thousands of people a year. Uh, you know, I ask them how they are. I ask them about their game. I ask them about their book. Um, and if they wanted to, to get into a whole protracted conversation, I kind of shift them slightly to the side so that I can keep talking with them while being a business person. And so it's, they want 
a connection. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that people want today at conventions is a connection with the author or editor. Okay. And so I'd like Mike to go next because I, I bet he can expand on this. And one of the reasons that uh, I'm pleased to have Mike on this program is that he gave a fabulous uh, presentation on this at our Nebula Awards uh, this year, which I missed. And then I kept running into people who talked about how good it was. So not to set any expectations, Mr. Underwood, but uh, perform. Sure. So in that presentation, one of the things that I tried to stress is how much work you can do to put yourself in a better position for hand selling at cons before you even get to the convention. And then you can do work before the floor opens. So something that I've been trying to iteratively uh, improve is the booth display that Angry Robot uses and then the processes that where I'm pre-selecting what stock to bring because as a larger independent publisher, we have quite a big backlist. So I'm not just bringing the six books that we published this year. I have a variety of attending authors and then we also have kind of new books and older books. So one of the things that I would implore um, everyone who's watching to think about is as much as you can tell and the work research you can do, figure out who the potential readers at the cons are likely to be. So the potential readers at a Gen Con are likely to be different than the potential readers at something like Worldcon. And you can think about how to um, set your title mix based on previous years' experience. So, you know, oh, well, I know that books by Cameron Hurley sell really well at Worldcon because this and this and that. Then you can use those, that history and that knowledge that you have to continually do better year on year and a lot of the work can be done beforehand. Um, there's also this kind of setting up the booth itself, um, but I can put a pin on that and maybe we can move back around to it. Okay, awesome. So Dave, how about you? What will you add to the idea of making it an experience for the customer? I think Jennifer is exactly right. By the way, Jennifer, I, I think uh, you're a co-editor with, with uh, Brian Thomas Schmidt of Shattered Shields, right? So I read that recently and I enjoyed that very much. Well done. Um, so uh, I think that more than books, what readers buy is authors, and readers want to buy, want to want to get an author they can make a connection with, that they identify with, that they feel like they understand, or that what for whatever reason they want to commit to an author and keep reading her books as they come out. So I think I think Jennifer is exactly right, and I think one of the consequences of that is as you're going to a con, one thing you need to think about clearly is your branding, uh, what you are communicating about yourself and about your books uh, and, and uh, that means you know hey if you've got a, a distinctive visual look uh, that, is, uh, that is part of how you want people to remember and recognize you, you should, uh, you should employ that at the convention. Uh, and if you want to be associated with you know certain genres, uh, you need to get on the right panels, you need to mark yourself in a way people go, oh yeah, that's the that's the writer and she always writes about or she is she likes to talk about or she is whatever. Um, because uh, because it will help because it's a great place to communicate your brand and you need to you need to be uh, putting yourself out there that way. I'm going to add to that a, a couple things uh, from my experience, and, and one is that, and I've noticed that Dave always comes well dressed with his hat, and I, I think that you do want to come feeling like you're really, you've brought your A game, you've spent some time building up enthusiasm, and you haven't been kind of thinking about it ahead of time as, oh, I've got to go to this con. Instead, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go meet a lot of people, I'm going to have a good time, which is hard for introverts, which most writers are. But you can spend some time after the con, you know, take 48 hours off and just sit in a dark room if you need to. But uh, don't come feeling unenthused, I would, I would say. Does anybody else want to add anything to the idea of the customer experience? Yeah, go ahead, Jen. Um, one of the, the customer experience things I want to impress upon authors when we talk about introverts is please stand. Please engage with the, the, the potential customer. So many authors who, they're, they're introverts, they don't know how to put themselves out there. They sit behind their table and they, they fold their hands up and they either don't make eye contact or they, 
they look up with this kind of terrified, oh God, please love me look. Uh, but they don't, they don't engage, they don't stand. Um, Josh Voigt, who I had hoped would be on this panel, uh, is a master at this. He actually stands in front of his table to engage with the customer and talk close one-on-one. -on -one. I always, I stand, uh, and you know, it's not great on the knees because I'm sit, stand, sit, stand, sit, stand. Uh, and I talk and I watch their body language and I look at the eye and see if, do they just want to read the backs of the book and leave them alone? Or are they looking for a conversation? And one of the ways to make this easier is to be able to pitch your book in a very short amount of time. Um, Peter M. Ball's uh, Flotsam Trilogy. It's uh, supernatural gangsters in Australia trying to stop Ragnarok from happening. There you go. That That is basically what the story is about. And if that catches them, that catches them. Or they'll shake their head and then you can move on. But stand. Engage. Be on their same level. And if it's a child who comes to the side of the table, you know, you, you can hunker down and talk to them. And because I do a lot of young adult stuff, but it's, act like you actually want to talk to them. Pretend you're that kind of person. You know, it's role play. Pretend you're the person who wants to get out there. And then, you know, take five minutes away from the table later to recharge. But it, that, that is the one thing that I really, really want to put out there is you need to put your body language forward to say, I want you here. I want to talk to you. I want to engage with you. I think that makes absolute, absolute sense. Someone will add? Go ahead. Yeah, it's kind of unfair bringing up Josh Vogt, though, because that guy's like, uh, he's kind of hunky and good looking and he has all his hair. And so he's, he's, uh, he's kind of he's kind of bait. He stands out there in the alley. People, people want to talk to him. Uh, I, and I love Josh. He's a, he's a great guy. Uh, the, um, I love what you're saying about, uh, about energy. You know, what you were doing at the booth communicates about your book whether you intend it or not. So if you're standing there eating a sandwich as customers walk by, you're communicating that it's more important to you to eat a sandwich than tell about the book, right? If, if you're on your phone, uh, and that communicates that, well, you know, Snapchat or, you know, I guess it's Pokemon Go now, is more important and interesting than your book. Uh, so yeah, you should be standing there saying, and I, and I love Jennifer, your point, you should be able, any book you're selling, try to have a very pithy pitch that, that makes the reader interested, that makes, that makes the, the customer formulate questions they want answered in their head, right? But you should be stand, you should talk to everyone that comes by. Hey, what do you, what do you like to read? And, and for the introverts, you know, maybe, maybe it starts with you, you give yourself, uh, a, 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 a go-to question. So I, I tend not to do this, but this is how we uh, we because I've just I've done so much selling that I will I'll say all kinds of stuff. But but we teach people who come to the Wordfire booth to volunteer. We'll say, look, it's easy. You j the first question is just, what do you like to read? Now sometimes they'll say uh, nothing or not what you sell, and that's fine. That's fine. So that, then they approach the next person. Hey, what do you like to read, right? So and maybe that's not the question for you, but but if you are introverted, if it scares you, and I understand, right? Um, then 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 have a have an easy, friendly little formula opening that you that you will that will start a conversation uh, every time. And just a piece of advice, whatever you're going to use. Um, so uh, the great thing about what do you like to read is it's not a yes or no question. Right, it opens up the conversation. They can say nothing. I don't read, but usually they won't. Right? Usually they like to read something. So even if they say, "Well, historical, you know, I read history. I read physics manuals." Okay, you're having a conversation. Right? They don't. You don't invite them to just say uh, no. Yeah, you ask open-ended questions rather than than yes or no's. So let's go back to, uh, Mike mentioned the idea of, of booth preparation. We're talking about kind of how to prepare for a con, and, and my single best piece of advice is wear comfortable shoes. Uh, but Michael will probably add to that. So talk to us about prep. Sure. So 
you know, one of the stages is going to be determining what space you have available to you. Um, cons will have a variety of spaces that they, they give you. For, if we're talking individual authors, it's probably one four or six foot table. Um, you may get a skirted front where there's a little bit um, of fabric there. You'll probably get your chair. Beyond that, you can think, do I want to bring a tablecloth and throw that over the table? Because that instantly sets me apart. Choose a, uh, a color for your tablecloth that fits. Uh, it either nicely complements or contrasts the book covers or the books that you're going to display, or that fits your overall brand. In Greerbot, it tends to be black and red, so I use black tablecloths. Um, this is also nice because then you can use that to flip it over and cover the stock at the end of the day if you want to leave the stock on the table, depending on what your levels are. Um, I also strongly recommend getting things like these um, table tent stands because then you can display books on them as such and put that on the table because that gets the cover up and visible. And if you put this out on the front of the table, someone can pick it up, look at it, and they know exactly where to put it back. It hopefully will gesture to a lot of, uh, of potential buyers, this is the copy of the book for you to pick up and read. And it makes that much easier. Um, so you can do that. And then there's also things like posters and other signage, um, which I'm happy to give other folks a chance to elaborate on rather than monopolizing. OK. So let's go, Dave, back to you, because I, I know that you have strong opinions about this, having worked with the WordFire booth. Yeah, we, um, most cons that we go to, um, we are the tallest bookseller, and if we're not the tallest booth, period, it's because there's that wall of t-shirts thing. Um, so we have a, we have a, a, a four-sided outward-facing banner scaffold that uh, is two stories tall, really. So we can have multiple tiers of banners. Um, and I, uh, you know, if you are a self-published author, or if you've got a couple of books and your publisher is supporting you going solo to a con, you're not going to do that because that's a big investment. But uh, again, one, you want to communicate brand. So you want to look professional. You want to look together. You want to look consistent. Um, and two, the uh, so look, there are a lot of books out there, right? Every day there are more of them, and the old ones haven't gone away. So the pool against which you are competing gets bigger all the time. It gets bigger all the time. So people have lots of choices, and uh, and, and they have lo they have lots of reasons to to pass you by and say say no, I'm gonna go somewhere else, right? So so don't give them any more reasons. So look professional, uh, look competent, look with it, and if at all possible, look successful, okay? People people uh, are, are attracted to success. If, if they feel like, oh, this is a successful author, then then probably, then I, her books are probably good. Um, there's nothing harder than being the guy at the, at the con with you're a six foot table yourself and a, a stack of one book, right? Because you're just screaming, uh, hey, I've written my first book. Come, 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 come buy it. Be an early adopter. I'm great, I promise. Maybe you are great, right? But you're, you're sort of warning people off. So depending on your, your scale, you know, who publishes you, you publish yourself. Uh, sometimes it may be worth it to, to, uh, to join a collective to, to give the impression uh, of, of mass and success. And then, of course, all the things that you worry about in yourself. Am I communicating? Uh, am I energetic? Am I, am I coherent? Do I look successful? And now you've got to worry about everybody else at the table, right? Did, 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 I, did I bring a partner who's dragging me down because he's got odious personal habits or, uh, you, you know, whatever? Um, so uh, yeah, Mike, Michael, that's, uh, uh, that's that's terrific advice. I like uh, we tend to have banners for the booth and for the publisher, and then and then banners for the larger of our individual authors. So I've got personal banners that advertise this series or that advertise me generally, and they're on the road with me all the time. Okay, cool. Jen, what would you add to that? Well, with with me because I am a a fairly successful uh, author, and I'm also a small press publisher, so I don't always have my books, 
what, what I do is I tend to have a, a rack that shows a whole bunch of different ebook cards on it on one side and a second rack on the other that has all of the books that uh, so I have uh, me in the middle and I can always opening question do you like ebooks or do you like physical books which is a good open-ended question uh, and then in the middle um, I, I have things like a, a sign up sheet so that people can sign up for things I also have my banner, a Jennifer Brosek banner. I have. Oh, cat hair. Uh, it's Jennifer Brosek, Wordslinger and Optimist, which is kind of my tagline, which is another opening. But that's also on the, the fan based business cards, which I have Jennifer Brosek author, a uh, wordslinger, an optimist, and then author, editor. But on the back, I also have all the books I've written so that people say things like, well, what should I read? And we talk a little bit. I can always mark which one of these books we talked about and give them the card. But I, I have me, because I am selling me. That, that's kind of my platform. But Apocalypse Inc. Productions is dark speculative fiction, so I am the author or editor of everything on the table. And that's part of um, setting it up, is setting it up so that I have, I know where everything is, I have my giveaways like, a, I have a, let's see, I, I did a story card. And I, I, I recommend everybody steal this. You, it's a very easy, cheap way. You write a single story, and then on the back, all of your books with the QR code as to where to go. And I did, for two years, I did The Many Deaths of Jennifer Brozek. So people would come up and ask me, so how did you die at this convention? Another way to get people to come to your table. Uh, and the final thing that is, my brand, Wordslinger and Optimist. I have had, I give away hundreds and hundreds of pens a year because I love pens. I think pens are awesome. Uh, people at conventions don't ever not pens, and they have my name, my tagline, my website, author, editor, and people will remember that because they're nice pens. They're not. It's pens are us, believe it or not. Dot com. And when you set these things up, you set it up with a consistency. You set it up where you know where everything is. And you set it up where you can talk from behind the table or in front of the table, uh, allowing you or the person you're working to reach everything on the table um, without like cross, without hitting each other. Usually what I end up doing is uh, I'm the salesman and the person I'm with is the one who collects the money, bags the, the books. And like uh, I think it was uh, Mike said, uh, you have the, I call them bundle copy books. This is the, the, the user display. You can pick it up, bundle it, but then we give you a book that hasn't been touched and mangled by the, the public, which we keep under the table. And so it, it, it helps you interface with your audience uh, and the customers, and it helps you move faster. It is a business, and that's something that is hard for a, an introverted author to, to really put out there. This is part of a business. Um, I mean, I have a lot of fun. I meet a lot of people, and they love Wordslinger and Optimist. Uh, they always ask me about it, so I think I've gone off topic. <laughs> no, no I, I know something you just said, which is a really important and I think dramatically underappreciated, because you will hear authors say, oh, writing is a job, and that's false. Writing is not a job, because the job is something that you have to go do 40 hours a week, and somebody tells you what to do, and you have a performance review every 
six months really show that 70% of us are actively disengaged from our job. If writing is a job, you're in trouble. Writing is a business. You are a small business owner. And that means you need to worry about, and that's what the, really that's the larger context of this conversation we're having here, is you have to think about brand, and you have to worry about you know your cash flows, and about the in inventory you're maintaining. And you should be thinking, you probably aren't, but you should be thinking about, well, what's my mission statement? What, what am I in this for? Uh, and how does that, how does that affect uh, what I choose to write and, and, and where I go? And, and, and you, sh you have to make calls about, hey, uh, uh, what, are the, what are the other parties with whom I'm going to form business alliances? Right? You don't work for your agent. You don't work for your publisher. You are separate businesses. You are making a kind of a distribution and publication alliance. You are making an alliance uh, about sales and marketing. Uh, and, and I think that that's – it took me years to realize this, which is ridiculous. I should have seen it earlier. But, but I think if you have that piece of clarity uh, up front, this is my business, you can start to make a lot better decisions. So that's, that lets me segue really nicely, in fact, to our next section, which is on sales. And we've, in fact, got a question from, uh, from Matthew Allen Fire. How do you organize and record sales made at a convention? So let's talk about the money stuff and how one handles the money stuff, because that's, that's fairly important. Do I have a volunteer to kind of go first? I, I, I think all of you handle this. Go ahead, Jen. With how, how do you handle your POS, your point of sale system? Well, we, we have two ways, and because I am a small press, I, I, this, this will work more for the individual. Um, we use uh, Square. That's the first thing. We, we take cash and we take charge. But we also keep um, daily tally sheets of what we have sold, what has been bundled together, and did we give anything away for free to kind of enhance the deal. Um, we keep track of this over the convention years. Um, we keep track of how many people have bought in cash and how many people have bought in credit. Uh, how many ebooks have been sold versus how many physical copies. And then I can see trends of, okay, well, I only need to bring this many, about this many of the new book and this many of a book that has already been out because this is how the sales have traditionally gone. Uh, we, because we're small, we're able to to keep track of everything on a very a daily basis at the convention, and then do statistics afterwards. Uh, so, uh, spreadsheets, Square, or you can use PayPal. That's another way of getting credit cards, um, and then cash keeping charge of who's got how much cash you bring in. Mike, how about how did how does Angry Robot handle sales? Any advice well, there? It's largely the same I think as the way that, that Jen handles it. Um, you know, we have we tend to do a convention special where you can get a discount if you buy several books at once. This somewhat um, complicates the point of sale recording system. So I have individual columns per title for how it was sold, so I can make sure that I'm tracking the money in um, accurately so that we pay royalties um, effectively, because since we're, I tend to be selling as the publisher, that's one of my responsibilities, versus if I'm the individual author, um, that's not really as much of a thing that I have to worry about. Um, we also use Square for, for credit card sales. Um, it's nice to be able to, to see that volume by time um, within the day. That's one of the things that I go back and look at is use some of their analytic tools and say, oh yeah, we were really more busy on Friday afternoon than I was expecting because we have this many sales this at, at the time versus the same time period on, on Saturday afternoon. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, and to be able to do a little bit of um, post-mortem uh, analytics as well. With ebook sales, we tend to do that as a an, uh, basically a social add-on where if someone is talking about the books and they, oh, well, I mostly read digitally, I can say, oh, well, if you buy the books here, I can send you the ebooks of everything we have ebook rights to um, after the con. I'm not yet set up to be able to do very seamless ebook um, fulfillment on the spot um, as easily, but I do. It's it's a way that I can show that I'm going the extra mile with someone because this is something that's available, but it's only useful for a very small uh, percentage of people, which then means that it gets to be more special. 
Okay. And Dave, do you want to add to that, or shall I move on? Because there's another question here. Just, just really quickly, Square is nice. They're, they're various systems. Square is nice because it's very scalable, and also unless they've changed, it's it's free. You pay ten bucks, but they give you a ten dollar credit, and they mail you the little device. And uh, as of the beginning of this year, uh, the device is compatible with the with the chip cards. Um, and, and if all you're doing is selling your own one or two books at a con, it's a very nice way to take uh, credit cards. You can set it up to run sales tax. You can set it up in a more elaborate fashion to keep track of inventory and provide you and lots of different data. So, so, so it, it's a good one, and the, the price is right. And the, it, it, Square is it, it just it's so tiny you can carry it in your pocket, which is awesome. It hooks right into your smartphone, which is amazing. So Matthew is asking now, uh, and I, this is an awesome question because uh, this is something that I, I think people really need to think about. Considering the whole investment necessary to sell at conventions, on average, are you breaking, breaking even, making money, or falling short? And I think this is a place where Jen talked about doing collectives, and I think that this is a place, I've done this at, at cons, where you get uh, four or five friends and you all sell together. And I, I would say, individually, boy, you're going to have to to work really hard to make it worthwhile, or you know, be fairly high up there. Now, other people may have other answers to that. Go ahead. Well, with, um, as as Dave said, like talking about business, um, and I may be, I apologize if I'm taking this out of your mouth directly. Uh, what you're going to say is that sometimes you make an investment. Sometimes you go to a con as a marketing expense. Um, you know, If I go to Gen Con as just me as an author, I know that the costs for the con, especially in total, not just the table, those are going to be fairly substantial. And just like a, a tour around the country to bookstores, it's going to be very difficult for even the most popular authors to sell enough books so that their royalty share is sufficient to defray costs. So looking at conventions, I think it can be a place where if you're look if you're at the place with your a stage with your business where you can spend a few hundred dollars to invest in your career, especially if you really like cons and this selling at a booth is something that you're comfortable with the way that the way I am since I have all this stuff for my day job. I'm very happy to spend, you know, two hundred, four hundred, maybe five hundred dollars out for a table, as long especially if I can team up with people. So one of the things to include in that that kind of conversation with yourself or with your team is what are we going to get longer term from this, as well as what are we going to get in the immediate term? Because uh, I think Jen also mentioned email list. You know, the capture of an email um, is a potential buyer for the rest of your career or for the rest of your business's life. So those uh, become kind of possibly positive externalities to the what is otherwise theoretically simpler math um, in should I go or not. Either of you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I would also say, um, well, look, so many of these points that you guys make are so great. They have they have like trails that go out in multiple directions. I want to say all the things. Um, first of all, uh, you will not get what you do not ask for. So you might as well ask the con to give you a free table, uh, especially if you can offer them something. I've done this. Uh, it, it's it's not always successful, but if you're polite and say, look. Um, I represent a, a group of, uh, you know, five independent authors, and we're local. And could you give us a free table? We would share it, right? They can say no. They're not going to say no, and you are banned, right? So it's so you might as well ask, uh, or you can offer something. Okay, if I can, I get a free table if I volunteer for a day. Uh, I'm also going to bring my Renaissance uh, storytelling uh, skills and and uh, and do a show. If I do that, can I get a table? Or can I get a discount? So, so y you should always ask, right? And and uh, it'll be awkward the first time, but you'll get used to it. And sometimes you'll save two hundred bucks, right? And uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. If you if you reduce a dollar of your cost, you have a dollar more of profit and cash flow, right? Uh, so uh, so so ask. Um, on the we've come around to it a few times uh, this idea of of being at a table with multiple authors and and I just wanted to throw in another point um, on that subject uh, if you're going to be at a table with two or three people or twelve if you're like a big twenty by twenty foot booth or something uh, learn to sell each other's books 
So uh, t t this is this goes in maybe maybe Michael even said it, but this goes in the prepare in advance uh, discussion. Make you know get a group email, make a Facebook page, a Facebook group, and say, look, here are my three books, and here are how here's how I pitch them, right? How do you pitch your books? Because you don't want to pitch your books and have the the customer say, well, none of that sounds quite right. You got anything else? And you go, um, this is kind of a cyberpunk book. Jill's in the bathroom, but if you come back, she can tell you about it, right? Or pick it up and look at the back and try and figure out what the book is about. You want to say, well, this is about so-and-so, and she's plays in virtual online games, and then one day a criminal conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. You want to, you want to give a pitch as, as the author would. So, uh, and, and, you know, you can't make people do stuff, but you can model good behavior, and people will often do, do it back for you, right? So if you go out of your way and say, we're going to be at a con in two weeks together, tell me how you pitch your books. More often than not, unless, you know, this is just a really socially unaware person, which may happen, they'll say, oh, yeah, how do you pitch your books, right? And then, and then the whole table has just, has just leveled up, and you're all much better off at selling each other's stuff. I think I'd, it's so much, yeah, it is so much easier to sell somebody else, else's book because you don't feel that kind of self-conscious, like, here is my child, judge it, uh, that you sometimes vibe that you inadvertently give off, I think, when selling one's own book. So but, 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 but I have to say, I have sold more books by being excited by my own book than anybody, I mean, I just, you have, you have to love what you've written. And you have to let that show. I, I sell a lot of books because I love books. I sell all, all of my Apocalypse Inc. Productions authors. But I sell my stuff by hand pitching and, and saying, hey, Apocalypse Girl Dreamy, it's got Weird West, it's got sci-fi, you know, it's got my favorite Lovecraft story in it. And I'm excited about this. And I smile. And when you are selling yourself, you're, you're, you're selling your book. Um, you have to love it. You have to not... You... you. How do I say this? But this, is, this is not the place to be self-deprecating. Right. This is not the place to be humble. You didn't come to be humble, right? Right. And you, you want to sell that. You want to put this in the, their hands. I, you know, I always say I never want to sell you a book you're not going to read or don't want to read. But if this is the kind of thing that you like, this is what you'll, I highly recommend it. Or, you know, it's Bram Stoker nominated. Or, you know, whatever. You can toot your own horn. This is part of that get up, talk, engage thing. Yeah, and if you're if you're in one of these groups, and especially if you're not as comfortable selling your own stuff, listen to what other people are saying. That this go, this goes both both ways. You know, be the person who learns from how other people are selling not only their book but your book. You know, if it's your first time and you're with a group of authors who've done this a couple times, or if it's your first time and you're all on your own but you're with a traditional publisher, you have a publicist hopefully. Um, who, or somebody else on your, on your publishing team who you can say, hey, I'm going to this con, I'm going to be selling my own book, uh, I'm not really great, I'm not very comfortable yet hand-selling my own book, um, you know, and some, some of them may have the time to be able to jump on Skype with you and talk it through, or maybe they'll just give you, like, the, the catalog page of how they, their sales reps sold the book. You know, whatever tools you think you're going to need, some people on your team, if, you, if you're working with a larger team, some of those may already be there, and you can build off of that. Um, to, to again to build off of what Dave and Jen have said, I think it's really useful to have several tiers of types of pitches for any given book. You know, you can have the genre pitch. Oh well, this is science fiction murder mystery. Um, you can have like the one sentence log line. That's um, you know David Walton has a book that's a, um, a a quantum like quantum theory murder mystery where he may or may not simultaneously be the murderer. Um, and then you have like the two or three sentence version. And if you're teaming up, you can put all three of those in your little bulleted list to share with the team. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time on kind of in practice is figuring out for any given person which sales and pitching method is going to be most um, appropriate. And you know, Jen has talked a lot about kind of swag items. And I think it's, it would be very useful to build yourself 
if you think this way, like a, a flow chart of what you're going to do with any given person. Person approaches table. How are you going to greet them? Based on how they've responded to you, what are you going to say? Are you going to ask an open-ended question? Are you going to ask a con-specific question? Are you going to kind of continue in a non-book conversation that they've started with their response? And a lot, for a lot of people, this is going to be implicit. But maybe if you have some anxiety or social stuff is not as easy for you, building a literal flowchart could be something really useful. And that will let you have practice. And with practice, it can become more um, kind of instantly authentic for you. And so those are a couple of, of bits of framework that are usually implicit for me, but may be useful to be uh, explicit for others, to, if, if everyone can pardon the digression a bit there. No, I think that's incredibly useful. And I know that, that for some folks, that's a big hurdle, right? Kind of, it's a huge anxiety provoking situation where you are around sometimes literally thousands of people. And it can be kind of scary. So I want to go to uh, ebooks because uh, Jen has mentioned selling them. And uh, Matthew Allen Thayer has asked Michael, what system are you looking at for on-the-spot ebook sales? So if you could answer that, and then we'll go to Jen, and then uh, Dave, if you want to talk about ebooks, we can swing to you. Go ahead. Yeah. So I've seen people do ebook sales just off of um, like USB keys or on-the-spot emails. Um, because I can't ever count on how good the e the, the Wi-Fi is going to be at any given convention, because um, at something like an Emerald City Comic Con or a Gen Con. Um, wireless, uh, basically getting, being able to have access to a Wi-Fi signal may run $800 or more. Um, I remember at B BEA a couple years ago, it was $800 either for the weekend for, or per day to be able to have access to wireless. So I don't, I don't expect I'm going to be able to have access to that. Um, if looking at tools like Gumroad has some instant ebook distribution options that I've been using on my own as an independent author. Um, so I'm investigating that. There's also Book Funnel, which I've heard about through indie author channels. So there's a few different options. Um, PayPal may also have uh, fulfillment options as well. I don't know if Dave and, and Jen can speak more to those. OK, Jen, talk us, tell us about your rack of ebooks, because okay. I, I know that's something a lot of people have questions about. All right, so the first thing that I want to say is, for me, bookmarks don't work. What works to have up is a postcard of the book that has the cover exactly as the book cover and then has the back of the book, literally. It, it is like picking up the book. That's the first thing. Now, we don't just put these willy-nilly. If people are really looking at it, they, you know, yes, they can take it. But otherwise, th this is not the thing we spread around. That's what the pens and the book, the 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 uh, business cards are for. We go through a site called eJunkie, e-junkie.com. It is a commerce site, and what you can do is you can set up uh, zip files with uh, the eBooks. For us, it's DRM free. Uh, PDF, Mobi, and EPUB, which hits all of the, the um, devices you have. Once they say, yes, I want to buy this ebook, and you know, however you want to do it, you know, $8, $3, together it's $9. That's the kind of thing we, I have prepared, already prepared, in a book. Stuff with a code on the back. This code has, is a unique identifier that you go through a, uh, there are many ways to get your unique identifiers. Um, and since I don't actually do this, my business partner does it, I can't tell you where to do that. But what happens is I talk to them, I offer to sell the, the to sign the front of the card, so that one, experience, two, they don't immediately throw it away as junk. That's also why the odd size. I recommend that they take a picture of the back with the code because 30% of people who buy ebooks at conventions actually have never uh, uh, used the code that they bought. The other thing is that sometimes 
because this is money-based code, uh, it they they go, oh, I get two dollars. Three dollars off. Instead of buying the ebook that I bought, which you know downloads, I'm just going to buy this other book with three dollars off. So it's a little bit harder to play with for uh, doing royalties and such. And the biggest thing is you must have the rights to sell the ebook. I cannot sell uh, the, Melissa, the Melissa Allen series ebooks because I don't have the rights to it. I don't have a connection to it. The Premier Press hasn't given me the connection, so you must own it. So it's very simple, you know. You're like, here's the ebook. You know, go to the go to this website, click on this image, enter this code, and download it. And then you know, we it's part of the the, the talking process, but it's an immediate sale. Um, this is also great for reviews. That you can, if for if you meet a reviewer you really want to talk to, you can be like, oh, well, here's a free ebook, and they use that. But this is a this my ebook sales have skyrocketed because there's little things like they're not heavy. They're a small, they're a lower price point. Um, when this book is. Twenty-five dollars because it's four books, and this ebook, which is the exact same thing, is ten dollars. Most people will take this ten-dollar ebook pack because it's a lower price point, but it's still a higher price point because it's it's higher than the you know two ninety-nine and such. Um, and the final thing is you can do the we call this our our sampler pack: five books for five dollars. You can get the first book of every series that we sell, and it talks about it on the back. And this is the only we only sell this ebook, and so this is one way to only sell ebook is to put it on a card. I I always sign these. I always have them take pictures of the back, but it's it they can go directly to our website and then download it. And you you get to know things like well if they're on an iPhone you're going to have a little bit you know you're going to have to go to a desktop or you know, it's there are other um, systems out there I think BookFunnel has been recommended to me but it's ebook only and not hard copy and eJunkie also sells the hard copy book as well so that is a really great point of sale for uh, the individual the the, the indie publisher. Is you can sell the ebook, you can sell the physical book from your website, and that's how we do it because it's it's a an experience, a signing, you know, we talk to them about the ebook, and then they walk away with something that they can handle, that's tangible, that has been signed, um, and they're happy. It's part of the whole experience thing, especially if they only read ebooks, and I've gotten that. So that's what I have to say about ebooks. Okay, Dave, you want to add anything? No, that was a lot of good advice. <laughs> um, all I would say is, in addition, is if you are starting out and you are, you have your one book on the table or your two books. You know, it may be this is more complexity than you need, and it may be that what you need is just the uh, the uh, talking point where you say, hey, you know, look, by the way, it's on ebook, and the ebook is four ninety nine, and you could download it with your app. You could buy it with your app right now, uh, or invite people to take a picture uh, of the cover. But I, 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 I love, I love all that advice. It's terrific. Um, I love what, what Jennifer said about cards too. Here's, here's what I, um, here's what I see happening with cards. People often feel like, okay, I, I got to do people being writers. Okay, writer, uh, I must do marketing. What is marketing? Um, a bookmark. I'm gonna get a bookmark, and I'll give everyone a bookmark. Uh, and the bookmark costs you 20 cents, uh, and you give away a bunch of bookmarks, people don't want them, and they go in the garbage, or maybe they go in a book, but they don't result in any sales. So I actually often, even though I will have cards behind a stack of books, if someone asks me for a card, and I think they actually don't want it, they're just trying to get out of the conversation, I won't give it to them. Because I'm not going to waste my money. So I like the way that Jennifer's, it's, it's not just, hey, here's a card, yay. It's, let me talk to you about it. And look, here's this information. 
ooh, and take a picture of this, and I'm going to sign it to sort of fetishize the card, right? To make the card more, it's not just a piece of free junk, like I got a hundred pieces of free junk in the bag from the con. It's something I care about. This this paper represents my meeting with my hero, Jennifer Brozek, and look, she signed right here, and this is what the, right? Uh, I think that's, that's really thoughtful. Uh, it's easy to throw your money away. Make sure people want the card and you make it meaningful for them before you give it to them. Okay, yeah, and I think that's good advice. So uh, I, I do have a question specifically for Jen. Uh, but first, Matthew, your question about selling to agents and publishers is kind of outside our scope, and maybe we'll hit that at another episode. This time we're focusing on the selling the books. Um, Jennifer, could you clarify, do you sell the cards as a point of sale with a code that grants access to the story, or do you sell the code via the card? I'm not, I'm... Is there any way to restate that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you re ask it, Matthew, and, and we'll kind of let's we can talk a little bit about giveaways, perhaps, while you're rephrasing, because I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I could answer with this link. You with this code, you get five downloads, and this after that, the code doesn't work anymore. And with eJunkie, you can set that up to be one download three downloads, 20 downloads. Uh, it is, this is both sale interest thing um, and the actual way to get the files. Okay. I hope, that, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> well, let's talk about, uh, we are kind of coming up towards the last nine minutes here. And we've got a couple more things in the list of stuff that we said we'd talk about. And one of them was giveaways. And I think we're segueing nicely into that. So no bookmarks or do Dave's thing. And, and I, I'm intrigued by the idea of you steadfastly denying someone your card as they ask for it. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, negging them into to buying your book, right? So let's talk about giveaways, though. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, I just think sometimes people will ask for your card right you say hey um, what do you like to read and they kind of say a little this and that but they don't really they want to be polite but they don't really want to sell you they don't want to buy a book and they don't really have a good way to get out of the conversation and even if you're not trying to be aggressive sometimes it kind of gets this moment where it's a little awkward and they want to get out and so they'll say can I have your card and they don't really want your card they just want to leave <laughs> so I say oh shoot I haven't got one <laughs> and let them go, because the cards cost me 20 cents each. They're very nice cards. I don't want them thrown away. It makes me sad if they're thrown away. So if you buy a book, I'll give you a card, even if you didn't ask for it, because I want you to be in touch with me, because I want you to remember, because I go, look, this is my card, and this is the cover art of the book you just bought, and look on the back side is a cover art of a different way. That's my actual email address. You can email me. You can you can tell me off, and here you go. I'm putting it right in there, right? Um, I'm happy for people to have my card. I'm happy to, you know, I'm not happy to give it to anybody where I think they're just going to throw it away. So I think that's the giveaway trick too. Is you is you, is you want people? Uh, you you got to give them something they're going to want. Uh, I mean, ideally, it's something that they want. It's value to them and it's free to you, right? So this might put us right back in the ebook discussion, and maybe this actually gets to Matthew's question. Uh, you know, is is Jennifer selling the card? I'm not sure I understood Matthew's question either, but is she selling the card as a way to buy the ebook? Like, I buy this physical card, but really I'm buying the right to download the ebook? Or is it more like a giveaway? Hey, uh, buy these three books, and I will give you this card, which is a free ebook, right? And then, and then that is $10 value to them and cost you the cost of printing the card, right? 20 cents. That's a great, that's a great giveaway uh, and, and, and a great upsell. What to, other? Go ahead. Go to ahead. add on to that, we do have. Um, I don't have them because they are hardback, signed, numbered, limited edition books. Like this one is the trade paperback, but we have the signed, numbered, limited edition. We did a hundred for those. When people are like, "Oh well," then I can say, "And if you buy this, you get the ebook for free, so that you don't you won't mess up your story, your 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 investment." And that is one way to do a giveaway. 
Um, and the other way is, like I said, buy this book, get the ebook for a dollar more. And you know that that is a way of selling. Um, it's not really a giveaway, but it's it is a distinct. Um, um, discount. Giveaways like pens with your name and your email or your, your uh, URL on it, um, they may never ever go to your website, but they'll have that pen. And sometimes I would pick up pens and be like, oh wow, I wonder where I got that. I wonder what that is. And I'll go to it because people are curious. Um, also, as an author, I just love having pens around. Um, other Giveaways are things like there's candy at, at the booth. Um, I personally don't do that very often because I, I don't want to do an open bowl and I don't have a trash can for them often. But uh, a lot of people do do uh, things like chocolate. I, I did do that um, when I was giving away my chapbook called Mastication. It was a horror story chapbook about things that eat people, and my question to them would be, can I interest you in, in, in some mastication? And there'd be that startlement, and then I'd show them the candy bowl, and then I'd show them the chapel. And those are interesting giveaway ideas. Um, I've seen people give away games, little tiny like games, and some people swear by bookmarks. They do swear by them, and I, I don't I've never seen an uptick, even after putting them in um, an uptick of sales, I should say. When like I gave away 3,000 bookmarks in the WestCon, which is one of the big uh, conventions out here. So most of my these are super cheap, 60 weight card. Um, you make a hundred of these, they usually spend I don't know 25 dollars. You cut them in half. Uh, you can make them even smaller, and there's something new that they can't get anywhere else. So let me pull in a quick related question because we are uh, crunching up against the clock. This is from uh, Stephen Gould. Do you harvest contact and marketing information by doing book raffles at the table? And my immediate inclination would be I, I don't put people on a mailing list without saying you are signing up for the mailing list. So I would be careful about that accordingly. But And I see people nodding. So, But you could tell them, right? You could say, yes, it is a book raffle. And check here if you don't want us to email you, because otherwise we will we'll email you and tell you, hey, when the sequel's out and so on. But I'm on the same page. I, I would not. I don't like getting those emails. I wouldn't want to inflict them on anybody. I, I will say a mailing list is a great, one of the best tools that you have, mainly because it's people who have opted in, right? And it is people who, who are interested. Mike, you mentioned this as well. Do you want to add something to it? Yeah, for me, um, the email sign up is really powerful because, you know, we're selling globally and as a, as a larger business, oftentimes when I'm at a con, I, I know that I'm going to get exposures maybe one through four, one through five, one through six out of the seven exposure um, idea. And that, you know, I'm more bullish on, on uh, bookmarks. You know, I, we also do badge ribbons. Like, this is one for me personally that Tor.com made for me, but we do them for Angry Robot. Um, with emails, they're a great yes and option where you have a good conversation, a good experience with someone, and they seem really excited. You see, and you can sign up for our email list, and I'll tell you when the next book is coming out that will magnify investment. It's also a good fallback position where someone, you know, th this is for a conversation you've had that's a couple minutes long and they've looked through a few different things like, ah, oh, well, I'm not going to buy today. But, well, uh, if, you, if you're not going to be able to make it back, you can sign up for the email list and we'll send you information about the new books. Um, so it's a good, it's a way of either recovering to a certain position where you're going to get something out of the experience, as are they, because they're going to get information, or you can magnify success. So I forgot to unmute for the first time during the entire episode. Uh, we're at an end here, unfortunately. We've come to the end of the hour, and uh, we will be having another chat hour in two weeks and focusing on Worldcon and what the uh, CIFA will be doing there and some previews and stuff like that. 
I hope this has been useful. I apologize that we didn't get to every single question. That, that's kind of awesome that we had so many we didn't get to them. Um, thank you to our fabulous panelists, uh, Jen Brozick, Michael Underwood, and Dave Butler, whose eyebrows I have been watching go up and down. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, if you've got feedback, if you've got stuff that you would like to see on a future episode, please feel free to mail me at cat.rambo at Thanks a lot, guys, and I'm going to stop broadcasting. Thanks, Kat.